I'm just going to say at the start that I spoke to Tom Scott before making this video and he's happy for me to use his idea. So thank you, Tom, for your blessing. I'll also say at the start, like Tom did in his video, that the thumbnail and title are unlikely to match the view count and like count exactly, but it should be quite close unless you're really early to the video, in which case it might be off by quite a bit. More on that in a minute. So Tom Scott made a video recently where the title contains the number of views that the video has, and it's always updating. So anytime you choose to go and watch Tom's video, you'll see the number of views that the video has is in the title. They match up. It's a great video. If you haven't seen it already, I recommend it. The link is in the description and in the card. Anyway, I thought it was really cool and I wanted to try it for myself because I actually really enjoy coding. I don't get to do it very often, but when a challenge comes along that is fun and interesting, I just can't resist. But actually, also, the content of my video is going to be different to Tom's, so I hope that I'm adding something to the discussion and not just copying him. Tom's video, the meat of it, is about APIs, and actually I'm going to talk about APIs as well. And given that Tom covers everything from the invention of APIs all the way through to the eventual heat death of the universe, what could I possibly add? Well, what I want to talk to you about is, it's a really interesting story about how Amazon transformed from being a company that sells books and loses money to a company that sells anything it damn well pleases and makes lots of money. And it's all to do with APIs. But before that, I want to talk about two ways that my video is different to Tom's from a technical point of view, because they have interesting consequences. The first is that the view count is in the thumbnail, not the title. And the second is that the title contains the number of likes, not the number of views. And those two changes have an interesting effect. Tom says in his video that if the title matches the view count exactly, it'll be a miracle. But actually, if you go and look at his video now, the chances are the title will match the view count exactly, but it's not a miracle. The reason it's happening is because the view count doesn't update every time you hit refresh updates every three minutes or so. In other words, the view count is stale most of the time. But importantly, when you refresh the page or load the page for the first time, that stale view count you get is the same as the stale view count that Tom's software gets when it requests the view count programmatically. So that's why they match exactly. Both systems are getting the same stale information. But for me, using the thumbnail to show the view count, I suspect it will be out most of the time. That's because in my experience, when you change a thumbnail, it takes about five minutes for that new thumbnail to appear for viewers of YouTube. And if the view count updates every three minutes or so, then most of the time the thumbnail will be out of sync with the view count. The title of this video is a different story again because the number of likes seems to change every time you refresh a page, so long as there's new likes coming in, like if it's a popular video. I'm not saying that video likes are counted instantly, like there's probably a delay between you liking a video and that like getting counted. I'm just saying that the like count doesn't become stale in the same way that the view count does. And because I only update the title every few minutes, I really do expect there to be just a slight mismatch all the time, well, until the video gets over a thousand likes, at which point YouTube starts to abbreviate the like count. So it'll say 1.1K likes, meaning 1,100 likes, at which point the title will be accurate, or at least to the number of significant figures that YouTube will allow you to check. All of this explains a phenomenon that you might have noticed, by the way, which is if you arrive early to a popular video, it'll have more likes than views, which doesn't seem possible. The reason it happens is because views and likes have to be validated by YouTube to stop people trying to game the system using bots and click farms to artificially inflate those figures. And the validation system for views and likes are different, and it seems as though the validation system for likes is quicker. So if you're early to a video, you'll see that the likes 
outstrip the views. So what is an API? Well, Tom explains it well in his video, but here's a quick recap. It stands for Application Programming Interface, and it's a way for different bits of software to communicate with each other, usually over the internet. For example, the public transport system in London has a service where you can check the arrival times at a station, or you can plan a journey, or you can look at a bus stop and see which buses are coming and how far away they are. For example, on this page here, you can see the buses that are due to arrive at Balgoni Road heading towards Chingford. But if you change the URL a little bit to this, you'll notice that the ID for the bus stop is still the same. You get this web page. It's actually not a web page, it's just a block of text. And it's designed to be easily read by software. I've actually written software that talks to this API because I wanted to show on my Pebble watch how many minutes before the next bus arrives at the stop outside my house. It'll actually show the next three buses if there were three buses coming up. And of course, YouTube has an API, which is why I was able to write software not only to get information about a video, but also then to update the video. What's all this got to do with Amazon? Well, the story comes from a memo posted by a software engineer working at Google, Steve Yege. He thought the post was internal, but it turned out that it was public and everyone could see it. But thanks to the good nature of everyone involved, it was allowed to remain up. The post was about the differences between working at Google and working at Amazon, where he used to work. It's actually quite critical of Amazon, but it talks about a few ways in which Amazon does things better than Google. It might not be the case anymore because the post is quite old, by the way. You actually can't see it anymore because it was posted to Google+, Plus, which isn't a thing now, but you can see it at the Wayback Machine, so I've left a link in the description if you want to read the whole thing for yourself. Yege recounts the day in about 2002 that a big mandate came down from on high, from Jeff Bezos himself, that said that every team working in Amazon must look at the data that they have and look at the functionality they have, and they must make that data and functionality available via a service interface. In other words, via an API. So for example, if you're in the marketing department and you wanna get some data from the fulfillment department, like you know how much of a certain product has been shipped out, you can't just call them up anymore and say, can you run the numbers and send me a spreadsheet? Instead, the fulfillment department needs to write an API that, and then the marketing department needs to write software that can talk to the API. And if you do it any other way, you're gonna be fired. Jeff Bezos was dead serious. And it seems as though that was the culture back then. People were genuinely scared of being fired. So they did as they were told. Why was this mandate so important to Jeff Bezos? Well, to see why, you only need to look at the consequences of it. This is just hypothetical, but suppose there's someone at Amazon whose job it is to put books on sale. Well, there's someone else in Amazon that looks at the API of putting books on sale and they think, well, I can use that to put jewelry on sale. I'm gonna start a new team that sells jewelry on Amazon or computer parts or something like that. That's just the beginning of it. This is the internal phase of changing the architecture of Amazon to this API system. During that time, they learned an awful lot. Like for example, I'm in a department here with an API and the department next door could accidentally issue a denial of service attack on my API because I've got some really useful data. So they're querying my API every second to refresh it on their screen and it's killing my servers. So they very quickly needed to learn about quotas. YouTube API has a quota, which is why you know, I would love to update the title of this video every five seconds, but I'd quickly run out of my quota. So it has to be every few minutes. They needed to learn about, you know, authentication, um, uh, making their APIs discoverable to everyone on like a, a searchable registry, for example. And after all these learnings, they eventually reached a point where they could start to expose some of their APIs to the public. And so now, Members of the public can sell things on Amazon and they can even do it programmatically with software. For example, I can link the, um, my Shopify shop 
using their APIs um, to Amazon using their APIs, but it goes beyond that. You can use APIs to host a website on Amazon using website hosting APIs. That whole system is called Amazon Web Services, AWS. And in 2018, AWS accounted for over half of Amazon's revenue. Amazon is predominantly a cloud service provider, which is weird because we tend to think about Amazon as a retailer. Netflix is hosted on Amazon Web Services. Reddit is hosted on Amazon Web Services. It's incredible, really, and that's the power of APIs. Thank you again to Tom Scott for the idea and for being okay with me making this video. Once again, if you haven't seen his, I really recommend it. The link is in the description. I've been thinking a lot recently about phone use, my phone use, and how it affects my mood and how it affects my relationships with other people. And I've been going through a process of stripping away the sorts of phone use that, it, that is net negative, leaving behind the types of phone use that is net positive. And it's surprisingly difficult to distinguish between the two sometimes, but what I've figured out is it's all down to finding good quality sources of information and consuming that information at appropriate times. And the sponsor of this video can really help with that. Blinkist is an app that takes the key insights from popular non-fiction titles and condenses them down to 15 minute reads. They're also audio narrated, so you can listen to them as well. I recommend appropriately digital minimalism. Since they last sponsored one of my videos, they've added audiobooks. So you can buy audiobooks for a vastly reduced price. Members get about 65% off compared to buying it full price. I recommend, for example, American Sniper. The first 100 people to go to Blinkist.com forward slash Steve Mould will get one week of full membership, absolutely free, no strings attached, you can cancel at any time, and then 25% off membership if you choose to continue. The link is also in the description. So check out Blinkist today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe, and I'll see you next time.